Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Miraculous. Um, we're, we're welcome to have Peng, Peng Zhu here from Johns Hopkins, um, from sunny Baltimore to sunny Seattle. And Peng's going to. Uh, snowy. Oh, snowy Baltimore <laughs> to, to not snowy Seattle. <laughs> well, uh, to beautiful Seattle. And, and Peng's going to talk about language modeling, trying to predict the next word. <laughs> that that was a stupid joke. Anyhow, go ahead, Peng. <laughs> and it's my pleasure to uh, present my thesis work here. and. Welcome. And you can stop me anytime you want uh, if you don't uh, see anything clear. So basically, I'm dealing with language model, um, which assigns uh, probability distribution over word sequences. And uh, uh, we always break up uh, the probability distribution to conditional probability distributions. So uh, we estimate probabilities of words given uh, the history words uh, that happened in the past. And this can be seen as a regression problem. And traditionally, language models are used for many pattern recognition problems, including speech recognition and uh, uh, machine translation. And language model uh, serves as a prior knowledge uh, of the language. And sorry. So a very simple but powerful solution to the language model problem is uh, uh, called Ngram language models. And in which you look at the n minus 1 items in the history instead of the entire history and, and uh, uh, use maximum likelihood uh, estimate to uh, compute the probabilities from uh, training data. Uh, we're th in, in this equation here, C is basically the count uh, of uh, Ngram happening in any training data. And this is, uh, of course, the best for training data, but uh, uh, we have tremendous data sparseness problem. And because any training data and the real test data you're going to see uh, are different, and most of the engrams uh, you can observe in the training data uh, will not be in the test data. And to give you an idea, uh, we. Uh, if we take the UPenn Tree Bank portion of Wall Street Journal, uh, which has about 1 million words uh, for training data and uh, 82,000 words for uh, test data, and uh, the vocabulary, we, uh, we use uh, 10,000 word open vocabulary. And words, are, words that are not in the vocabulary are mapped to a special unknown token. So if you look at Ngram statistics, in fact, more than 54% of the trigrams uh, are not in the, in, the, in the training data. And it goes up to 86% for the 6 gram. And this uh, very sparseness problem actually uh, makes language modeling a very difficult regression problem. And the Ngram model, uh, as we present here, needs at least uh, the vocabulary size raised to the nth power, that number of words, to in order to cover all the Ngrams. Yes? Not unique in gram, it's by uh, token, not by type. So, of course, there, there, there are more data, and there's no data like more data. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Berger and Mills in 98, they already tried uh, something called just in time language model, where they look at a um, search engine uh, to query. Uh, the engrams they are going to see and uh, get account for that engram from the web. And there's more work in that direction. For example, Ju and uh, Rosenfeld in 12, 2001, they used Elder Vista to estimate engram counts from the web. And uh, uh, there's an uh, interesting work by Banco and Brio. Uh, they found actually for uh, many um, natural language processing uh, problems, efforts should be directed toward data selection, collection, instead of uh, new learning algorithms. And uh, after that, uh, there are works trying to get a, um, Ingram counts or data uh, 
in text format from the web. And one of these, uh, these approaches, the Bulico et al. Uh, approach, they collect uh, web text by querying the web using uh, frequent engrams uh, from their small training data. And uh, the collected data uh, from University of Washington uh, was used in uh, last year's rich transcription speech uh, recognition evaluation. And so actually we argue that the web data is not the solution to the data sparseness problem, simply because the web argue, arguably has everything, but at the same time it's also, also noisy. And in fact, by uh, the study of Drew and Rosenfeld, the web does not have everything. For example, what I'm talking right now, you, some of the words you probably, or the engrams you probably cannot get from the web. And in fact, they, they tried 24 random web news sentences. And there are about uh, 453 trigrams, out of which 46 were not uh, covered by AltVista. That was in 2001. So, and sometimes for uh, problems uh, in a specific domain, the domain, in-domain training data is, is not always easy to get. And that's also one of the problems. So, so far, um, I have uh, presented the problem. And so there have been a lot of research in dealing with the sparseness. And I'm going to over, uh, give you an overview on that. And then I'm going to talk about my approach, uh, the random forests approach for language modeling and with uh, some experiments. So basically, uh, people tried all kinds of smoothing techniques. Uh, what smoothing does is to take out some probability mass from the engrams in the training data and distribute among the others that you cannot see in the training data. And there have been a, a tremendous uh, amount of work in this area and uh, over 10 different smoothing techniques were proposed. And among which, according to the study by Chen and Goodman uh, in 98, the interpolated connectionized smoothing is consistently uh, uh, the best la language model smoothing technique. The interpolated connectionized smoothing is uh, of this uh, form here in this equation. Uh, where uh, C is, uh, again, the count from, uh, of an uh, engram event from the training data. And there's a, a discount constant D uh, uh, there uh, to uh, take the probability mass from the C in engrams and redistribute according to uh, lower order connectionized distribution to uh, other engrams. So um, other than that, there are work in uh, word clustering, where people try to combine words into equivalence classes so that the vocabulary size will be much smaller. And uh, Goodman showed in 2001, uh, actually, all components of a word clustering model uh, need to use uh, uh, smoothing, uh, proper smoothing. And uh, he also showed the uh, interpolated connection I, again, uh, worked the best for this uh, clustering model. And also, there's a decision tree. And instead of clustering words, it clusters histories into equivalence classes. And this seems to be a very appealing idea. But only uh, negative results were reported, according to a study uh, by Potaminanos and Janinek. So uh, also, there are uh, models that are smoothed by uh, the definition, uh, maximum entropy models and neural networks. And one thing for the maximum entropy model is that um, there's almost no difference in performance from an interpolated connection I. And uh, it's later on it showed uh, that it's actually uh, quite close even in uh, the uh, solution form to uh, interpolated connection I by Goodman. So the neural network model represents words in real vectors and use a neural network to compute the posterior probabilities. And the models actually uh, wor work pretty well uh, if uh, um, interpolated with interpol interpolated connection I again. So it relies on uh, the connection I smoothing again. And there are also work uh, beyond engrams 
Uh, I would say this is also dealing with sparseness problem because um, it uses longer histories and represent uh, the longer histories uh, by parsing techniques uh, using syntactic or semantic information. And uh, there's work by Kelba Jernak and by Rourke Charniak, and those are parsing techniques. And also uh, there's almost parsing technique where people use uh, semantic information. Um, the, all those models actually achieved uh, uh, significant improvements over the um, NGRAM models. And we, we know that actually all the models here are the components uh, have the same sparseness problem as the NGRAM because each uh, component of those uh, parsing models um, are modeled by uh, NGRAM model. And uh, smoothing is also very important for those approaches. Therefore, um, our motivation is actually a better smoothing technique is often very desirable. And uh, if we can use the available data in a better way, it will help uh, uh, our applications. And also, the improvements in smoothing should also help other means of dealing with data sparseness problem. And I will show, actually, it works for clustering and also for the structural language model of Kelba and Genetic. So our approach is uh, an extension to decision tree language models uh, in which we try to overcome some problems of uh, decision tree uh, language models. Uh, for example, the local optima and uh, data fragmentation in uh, decision tree construction. And the basic idea is to use random forests instead of uh, a single decision tree. A random forest is a collection of randomly constructed decision trees. And before going into the random forest, I'm going to present uh, how uh, we are going to construct the decision trees. And a decision tree uh, is, uh, is uh, an equivalence classification of uh, histories. And each leaf in a decision tree is specified by uh, set of questions and uh, whose answers will lead from the, the root node to uh, leaf node. And therefore, each leaf corresponds to a subset of uh, uh, histories and also uh, a subset of the training data you're going to see. And therefore, in this way, uh, all the histories in the training data are uh, partitioned or classified. So uh, in a data-driven approach, decision trees are constructed from uh, some training data. And the construction requires three uh, basic things. One is the set of possible questions. Right? In a decision tree, we ask questions at each node, and we ought to know what questions to ask. And uh, there, there, there has to be a criterion evaluating the desirability of, of the questions. And uh, since we have a large amount of possible questions, we want to know which one is the best for uh, a current node. And also we need a construction stopping rule uh, in the tree growing uh, procedure. Or we can uh, grow the tree uh, until it's uh, uh, completely grown and then prune it back using some also some uh, <coughs> post pruning rule. And here's uh, the example in trigram, right? We have three words uh, in, the, in, in, in trigram and the questions we look at are about the positions. For example, it's the word uh, W minus I, which means the words in the ith position in the history uh, in some set S and, uh, or in, uh, in the complement uh, SC. And so there are two possible positions for a trigram only. And uh, each pair, the uh, set S and uh, its complement, uh, defi defines a possible split of uh, a decision tree node and also of the training data. And here we want to uh, emphasize that the set S and its complement, they are complements with respect to training data. So anything that, any word that uh, did not occur in the training data will not be 
uh, included in the, in the set S or S complement, and we will deal with that separately. So S, is S based on semantic classification? Or it's just word identity. Oh. Just word identity. So uh, we can see actually in the decision tree, a node gets less data than its uh, ancestors because uh, the training data is split into two uh, directions. And uh, uh, we can obtain the uh, S and uh, its complement uh, by some exchange algorithm, which is a greedy algorithm. And uh, graphically, this is, uh, uh, for example, we have some training data in this uh, uh, ABA and, and stuff. And the words in um, bold are the words we're going to predict. So in this case, we have only A and B. And so uh, at the beginning, we have this node which has all the histories before we construct the decision tree. And this is a perfect case where just look at the first word in the history. We know uh, we can dis uh, distinguish the um, words to be predicted perfectly. Like if we have the first word A, then we know uh, in the training data, uh, the predicted word can only be A and, and vice versa. So if we have a new event, um, BBB in the test data, and we are lucky and it goes to the right direction and uh, predicts the future word B perfectly. But often we have cases like you know, we know how to go, uh, where to go from the decision tree, but the the future word never occurred in that uh, uh, in the in the histories in that node. And in this case, A, D, B, and B it has count zero in the left node. And another way, in another case, we have a new event C, B, A, and now uh, since we have only A and B uh, as the first word in the training data we don't really know where to go uh, from this node, from the root node here. So those are the two cases we're going to deal with in our uh, decision trees. In order to deal with this, we actually grow a decision tree until the maximum depth using only the training data. Here, uh, by maximum depth, I mean either each leaf node has only one history in it, so there's no way you can split further or all the histories there uh, have the same statistics and uh, it doesn't make sense to split them uh, further on. So the questions are uh, automatically obtained as the tree is uh, uh, constructed. And we use only training data uh, likelihood to evaluate the questions. And therefore, we have a very efficient algorithm uh, that can construct the trees very quickly. And we don't perform any smoothing during the tree growing. And after that, we are going to prune the decision trees to maximize some held out data likelihood. Yes? So uh, when you say that the histories at the leaf nodes must have the same statistics, do you mean the relative frequency distribution over the future word? Right. Every history is the same. Right. OK. It's, it's very often that some histories uh, they uh, have only one word uh, in the predicted position uh, in the training data. And uh, some histories will share the same word. In that case, uh, it doesn't make sense to split that node. So we, uh, during the pruning of the decision tree, uh, since we use held out data, we need uh, to incorporate some kind of smoothing technique because many of the engrams from the held out data will not be seen in a, in a training. So actually, we extend uh, the connectionized smoothing in this case to handle the smoothing. Here's the, uh, again, the connectionized smoothing on, on top, on the top, the first equation over there. And I highlight, uh, highlighted uh, the differences between the connectionized smoothing and our decision tree smoothing. The, the uh, ma main difference is in the count. Before in the Kanashnai, a count of a, uh, some engram is basically from the training data, you, uh, you, you, you count how many times it, it happened. And uh, for the decision tree, it's slightly different uh, because we have now uh, equivalence classifications of <laughs> histories. So the count of a word uh, given 
a, a node in the decision tree uh, noted by the equivalent class phi uh, here is uh, the the count of that word following any of the histories in a uh, in a uh, decision tree node. Basically, you add all the counts together to get the count for that node. And other than that, it's almost identical. And of course, the interpolation weight has to be adjusted because of that as well. And we should note that here, if we use the connection I uh, uh, lower order probability distribution for smoothing, um, all histories in the same node are not smoothed in the same way because they may not share the same lower order history. Uh, if you have two words in the history and you drop one, the one uh, you keep uh, from history to uh, history to, di to history may not be the same. And also, we only use leaves as equivalence classes after the tree is uh, pruned. In, in that case, uh, if we look at the equivalence classification, uh, remember we have the case where we stuck in some intermediate node uh, for some engram. We don't know where which direction to go. In that case, the equivalence classification mapping will be an uh, empty uh, function. So all the count of uh, all the uh, words in the vocabulary will have zero count with that uh, now. I would say it's a now node with that now node, and therefore uh, the first term in the second equation will always be zero. And uh, so the interpolation weight will be w simply one for, for that particular node. And we use only the uh, lower order Kanasani distributions for that case, right? So I see you have a hat on the back row. Yeah. So isn't this supposed to be a recursive formula? It is uh, recursive in, in, in if you look at the formula, but I did not mention the, the detail about Kanasani smoothing because the lower order uh, count for a Knesset distribution is different from the uh, the uh, normal count that we uh, use. It's not like you count from the training data how many times the bigram occurred uh, and they use that as your count. You actually uh, count how many times that bigram occurred in a, a different trigrams. So it's it's basically a different definition of counts. That's why I use a hat there, too. So uh, after this, there are still problems with the decision tree construction that we uh, did not address. Basically, the training data fragmentation problem. As the tree is uh, constructed, we have less and less data. Uh, the questions are selected uh, on, the, on the basis of less and less data, and they may not be uh, reliable anymore. Uh, in the in the nodes close to the leaf, and also the exchange algorithm we use to uh, obtain the pairs uh, set, uh, S and S complement, uh, it's a greedy algorithm, and also the tree growing algorithm also with the pruning uh, is also greedy. And in some cases we can have deep trees. Uh, there are uh, parameters uh, for pruning the trees. If we set the parameters uh, in some way, we, we have deep trees, then we feed the training data very well. And uh, it will not generalize to, uh, to any test data. Uh, it, instead, if we have shallow trees, then uh, the histories are not sufficiently refined. And we, again, lose the predictive power of, uh, uh, of all the histories in that node. So in order to deal with this, uh, we um, borrowed the idea from uh, Leo Breiman in uh, Random Forests. And he applied uh, the idea of Random Forests to many uh, relatively small problems of uh, classification and uh, regression. He uses uh, different random samples of data and also randomly chosen subsets of uh, questions to construct a certain number of decision trees. And then uh, applies a test data to all the different decision trees uh, to get uh, the uh, class labels for um, that uh, data. Uh, there, there's k here, for example, k different class labels. 
And uh, finally, uh, the winner uh, gets all, so we accept the uh, plurality decisions uh, for the final decision. In order to use this in our problem, uh, before that, I give you just a simple uh, example. If you have three trees and uh, two of them classify uh, test data as alpha, then the final decision will be alpha. And the three trees are uh, randomly constructed. In order to use this in our problem, remember we ask questions about positions only. Uh, so it's possible to randomize the selection of positions to ask about, in which case we have only three alternatives. Uh, we have, for a trigram, we have two positions. It's either we ask about position one or position two or the better of the two. And uh, we can also, actually it's very important to randomly initialize the greedy exchange algorithm. Since the algorithm uh, results in lots of uh, uh, different solutions for different initialization and uh, uh, it's always a local uh, optima and it's uh, better to uh, explore different uh, local optima in different trees. If we construct 100 decision trees for example then uh, we as before in the decision tree model we have a decision tree la uh, language model probability for the ith tree here and uh, the final estimate will be simply the average of all trees. And we take only the average and hoping that uh, by the law of large number, this converges to the ex expectation of the probability estimate uh, in, uh, where the uh, random variable here is the tree itself. And of course, the uh, space of the trees is uh, enormous and uh, we cannot get all the uh, trees to, to really compute the expectation and that's why we use the average and uh, our c random decision tree construction will be like sampling in the tree space. Yeah. If I miss this, what is, a question that I notice of the form is position I, is the word in position I in this particular set of words and that's right. the only questions you ask? Yes. Okay. That's the only form. Yeah. Go ahead. So uh, uh, I didn't get the random uh, construction of the trees. Yes. Uh, in addition to selecting the position, you're asking also, you could also randomly select which subset to ask questions about. Is that what you, what you mean by random initialization? Um, it's close. Actually, the, we, we have for each particular position, we have a, a collection of words from the training data. Right. And we initially uh, randomly split them <coughs> into two um, disjoint sets. And, and now the exchange algorithm will move things around and see if there's any improvements. So that initialization can be randomized. So each time you run, you will get a different solution. But it's not like uniform sampling. It's a sampling of kind of good sets. Yes. Right. Yes. So you only basically uh, start that off initially with a random, random partition. That's but as you could imagine asking a question randomly at each step. Right. Uh, that's actually the effect of the random initiali initialization is actually the uh, random selection of the possible questions and only the good questions. And we, we actually... Uh, ask questions only, we use only local optima as the possible questions. Right, right, right. So yeah. it, it will certainly have effects throughout. That's yeah, yeah, for sure. exactly. So you don't do like uh, bagging type stuff where you, where you randomly select data? I, I, I don't present uh, that results here, but I did that too. And uh, it seems bagging works well with this randomization. Just bagging is not going to work. Right, right. Did you also, maybe I'm getting you sidetracked, did you also try in the exchange algorithm accepting bad splits with some small probability, like an annealing type idea? Um, no, I didn't. Yeah? Just to make sure I understand this right. So any given history uh, will reach on each of the three? In the training data, yes. But at test data, there's no guarantee. It's not a guarantee. Um, yes, sir. That's when, uh, in this equation here, 
uh, it will be mapped into a null node and it will back up to the connection I lower order. Okay, so now I'm going to present some results and using this random forest language models. And for, um, we first conducted uh, perplexity uh, experiments where we measured the perplexity of a language model. The definition of a perplexity is over here. It's basically uh, related to the cross entropy of the test data using the, uh, your model. Um, and we used the uh, UPenn tree bank um, as uh, our test, uh, as our uh, corpora here, and there are about one million words, and we use 90% for training and 10% for holdout in order to prune the trees. And so the baseline here first is uh, the Knesnite trigram using interpolated Knesnite smoothing. And if we don't perform any randomization uh, in the decision tree construction, we have a decision tree language model. And if we, um, in this experiment, we used actually 100 random decision trees, and now we have a random forest random, uh, trigram. It's interesting to see actually on how that data and test data, um, the decision tree language model uh, improved a little bit on the, on the how that data, but instead it actually uh, hurt the performance a lot on the test data. And instead, the random forest trigram improved over 10% on the test data. And of course, uh, we used the held data to prune the trees, and it helped about 20%. And, oops. It's interesting to see, as the number of uh, trees in the, in the random forest grows, how well the model uh, performs. And here I have uh, the plot of uh, the random forest trigram on the test data and the uh, held out data as the function of number of decision trees in, in the random forest. And uh, the middle line, uh, dotted line, is actually the baseline on uh, test data. And the, the line above is uh, the baseline uh, Kness 9 model on the held out data. It's interesting to see that we actually are closing the gap between the held out data and, and test data. Um, well, the, the, the decision trees are random, and uh, occasionally you can have a bad decision tree and will actually hurt the performance a little bit. But overall, you can see the improvements in, with less than 10 trees. Yes? We've got a question here. Why is the uh, baseline perplexity for the held out worse than for the test? It's uh, just because of the selection of the held out and the test data for that particular selection is uh, worse than the test data. So the held out data was not used for estimating the Knesset model in any way? It is used in my implementation of uh, Knesset nice smoothing. It's used to estimate the discount constant. Yeah. So in that sense, it is fair because. Right. How many discount constants did you have? I used uh, simply one. So I did not use three different constants. Did you use one also for the Canadian Night baseline, or did you use three constants there? I used one also there. And also I used one in the decision tree. In fact, it's the same one. I did not optimize the discount constant for the decision tree. And for was that value? Hmm? What was the constant? Oh, um, it's uh, for different orders, it's slightly different. Uh, for the unigram order, it's, it's around uh, 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 0.3, something like 0.3. And for the trigram, it's close to 0.9. So basically, the, for the trigrams, you trust them less than the unigrams. All right, so now we want to have some analysis why this is happening. And uh, we anal analyze this by um, the term uh, seen event. In a Knesset trigram, um, a seen event is basically uh, some engram that happened in the, in the training data. And for the decision tree, it's slightly different. Uh, I, will see, I will say it's, uh, it's a seen event if it happened with any of the histories in the equivalence class. 
I would say that's the scene event. Okay, now I'm going to analyze the test data events. Uh, again, this is uh, not by type, by token. Uh, by the number of times they are considered seen in the 100 decision trees in this case. And I got this uh, bar chart here uh, on the x-axis. Again, it's the number of times in a decision tree. Uh, the first one is zero, which means none of, in, in this category, none of the test data event can be mapped into uh, uh, the, oh, sorry, can be seen in any of the 100 decision trees. It's, the, the scene time is zero. And then I have uh, different categories, 1 to 9 and 10 to 19 and so on, until at the end I have 100, which means the, te the test data events in that category it, uh, are seen in any of the 100 decision trees. And it can happen only for the uh, seen events for the connection eye trigram. Uh, if if, uh, if an engram is seen in the training data, and uh, for sure it will be mapped to one of the leaves and it will be seen uh, there. And that's why we also have uh, 100. And it's interesting to see as the number of times uh, that the events are seen in the, in the 100 decision trees, as the number of times grows, the relative improvement from the ra uh, random forest trigram uh, to the connectional trigram uh, increases. And uh, the, that means the more times you, uh, you, you see that event in the decision trees, the more improvement you can get. And I cannot, didn't show here in this plot, but basically if you uh, break the, uh, the bar even further, so it's basically after three times you have seen that event in the decision trees, you start to see improvements, small improvements. And overall, um, the model, random forest model, focuses on the uh, events that cannot be seen in the connection line model and make a, a difference there. And uh, for the, the events that are seen in both cases, uh, meaning in the connection line tri trigram model, and also 100 times here in the decision trees, it's uh, almost the same. You don't lose there, but you gain in other cases. Um, so this, uh, this is the number of times it's seen in the decision trees. In, so in the 100 decision trees, number of trees that right. you are seeing. Uh, but uh, how does it relate to the number of times it's seen in the, in the Knesset trigrams? Uh, it's only the last bar, uh, the 100. Uh, that's the trigram events that are seen in the Knesset And from 0 to 99, those are the events that you cannot see in, uh, in the connection eye trigram. So all 0 to 99, those are the cases where you saw them that number of times in the decision trees and right. you saw them zero times in phase nine. Right. And then the, the last bar is you saw it 100 times in the decision tree, exactly 100 or more than 100? Exactly. I mean, I have only 100 decision trees, so it's uh, at most Point. 100. And then how many times do you see it in the Knesset 9 then? It's so zero because the, the trigram event just simply did not uh, happen in the So this is data. all for events that are not seen for unseen trigram. You are, you're not comparing tri things that you actually saw in the, in the, tri in the regular trigram model. Right. The, 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 the events that I actually saw in the trigram case, the uh, <laughs> Knesset 9 case, is the last bar, right? So that's what the, all the events that can have zero or have non-zero counts. Okay. And uh, then uh, for the uh, last bar, it's like uh, uh, all the events there. It's basically 45% of the test uh, data. I don't understand why the zero, when you don't see it in your trees, you should be backing off to the bi -gram Yes. If you're smoothing. Right. And in Ness and I, you should be doing the same thing. Well, the uh, there's an interpolation weight. So that is just due to a different interpolation weight? No, actually, when I say this is not seen, I didn't mean the history is not seen. I mean the entire event is not seen. The history could be seen. In that case, for connection eye uh, smoothing and the decision tree smoothing, you have a different well, interpolation so weight. I ran my fire, but you don't have a lead that Right, exactly. Okay. So since it's uh, um, 
pretty good for trigram, we want to move on to higher order engrams. And for, yes? Sorry, if I can ask another question. For sure. The, the, this is the, these graphs are the perplexity reduction for those number of times. But do you have like what fraction of events? So like do you have the count? Right, right. It's, it's about 8% for the zero category. Okay. And then uh, the more times you see in the in, in, in decision trees, the less the percentage is. But that's why I, I uh, put them into <coughs> categories like 1 to 9 and, uh, and 10 to 19 and so on. So, so, so the number of completely unseen, um, of unseen his events in decision trees is 8%. Right. And uh, in your baseline, you had that number earlier. It's about 54 okay. percent. So if we move on to higher order engrams, and for four, five, six, and on the class and I uh, role, we see improvements from trigram to four gram, and small from four to five, and almost nothing from five to six. And we have almost uh, the same trend here for the random forest. And uh, so this is, uh, the, the, the good news is uh, we can still get improvements uh, from uh, uh, high order engrams. But the bad thing is we don't gain as much as the trigram uh, for, for example, five gram and six gram. And we would like to see why this is the case. And actually, if you look at the smoothing, on top is the uh, decentralized smoothing we used before. And we back off to the Kinesini, in trigram case, the bigram. And in the six gram case, we will be backing off to the Kinesini five gram. And we know you know the random forest five gram should be better than the Kinesini five gram. So why don't we back off to the random forest uh, lower order probabilities? And that's why we have this embedded approach where we use a better smoothing um, to embed into our decision tree smoothing. So for each decision tree, we have a lower order random forest model for uh, backing off. And the, uh, the rest of uh, the two smoothing approaches are exactly the same. <clears throat> In that case, we again uh, have the same uh, table here with uh, one more row the embedded random forest approach. But we see actually we got much more gain for four gram. And uh, uh, s a f small amount for five gram uh, from uh, the random forest to the embedded random forest. Yes? Sorry. No, no problem. Uh, so the embedded random forest now do doesn't use any sort of mason anymore. It doesn't use. Knesset and I smoothing explicitly, but uh, uh, the the way I um, counted the events uh, is still the same as the Knesset and I. So I don't use Knesset and I as the smoothing, but I use the same way to, to count the events. Basically, for in a trigram case, for any bigram, it's not the bigram, the number of times that bigram occurred in the training data. It's the number of different trigrams that bigram occurred in. Okay, so, so you're saying that you're borrowing some from, from the Mason 9 way of doing things, but when you're backing off, you're backing off to your own as the, as the lower order. Right. And the, uh, sorry, the number of, uh, so for each decision tree, you have to create a separate random forest for the lower order. Yes. So the total number of decision trees is now much higher. Well, it's the same. I mean, I create 100, for example, 100 decision trees for the bigram. And then for trigram, uh, I don't recreate any of the bigram decision trees. I just use those 100 for smoothing. So I still have 100 for each order. OK. okay. Yeah. So I haven't read language modeling papers for a while. I mean, is this result exciting or so-so or, or like Nobel Prize? Or I mean, just in terms of, you know, <laughs> um, I think uh, going f uh, uh, more than 10% of reduction from the interpolated Knesset 9 model is exciting news. Uh, people have been trying to beat inter interpolated Knesset 9 for seven, eight years, and uh, not many models can beat interpolated Knesset 9 using the same statistics. 
Uh, clustering model can help uh, in, in some cases, and I will show uh, in, in a couple of slides later. Yes, so to go from 3 gram to 6 gram, uh, the protracted improvement is so little. Is it normal or is it something it is, uh, it is normal. Um, I actually computed the conditional mutual information of, for example, in the, in the trigram case, uh, so sorry, in the foregram case, uh, it's like adding one more word to the trigram. You can compute the mutual information of the predicted word uh, and the word you are going to add given the word you already had, right? And that's the indication how much you are expecting from adding that one more word. In, 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 uh, in fact, for five and six gram, that's very small. The reason is for this training data, we have only one million words. Again, uh, five, uh, five gram, almost all the five grams have count one. And you don't really gain by adding the sixth word. Yeah. The question is, what's the takeaway from that observation? I can imagine two takeaways. One is, don't bother with longer n-grams. And the other one is, uh, get a decent sized training set. Yeah, I will, I will show you a decent size of training set later okay. on. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, remember I have I had this slide before saying improvements in smoothing should help other means of data sparseness. Right? Um, I tried clustering. So um, there are three uh, simple clustering approaches. Uh, you can find the details in Goodman's uh, 2001 publication. And the first one is called a predict. Um, here I highlight the, the component of that model uh, in which I used, I've applied the random forest approach. For the other component, I still used Knesna. So, and then for the three, uh, it's actually interesting. If I use 64 classes for the first clustering model. I can get a perplexity of about 140. And this is a small improvement from the CNAS-9 model. But if I apply the random forest to only the second part, then I can still get additional improvements. Um, for the other two uh, uh, clustering models, we don't see improvements uh, in even uh, comparing to the CNAS-9 trigram. It actually got worse. And still, if we apply the random forest approach, we can get much better gain there. Yeah. So, so I, I don't remember your exact numbers, but those, those numbers for Canadian I index and index predict are worse than the, the near baseline? Is that what you're saying? Right. The baseline is 145. So, so I got pretty good improvements. Do you have any explanation for I, why um, I did and you didn't? I read, uh, I read your... Uh, 2000 ICSLP paper in which you actually tried a data size of 1 million words yeah. in which you did not get improvement for that two cases. Uh, it's only later on in the 2001 publication you did get improvements for the 1 million word corpus. And for some corpus smaller than that, you still don't gain by using the index and index predict. And then those also aren't obviously are not the uh, best of the clustering techniques I reported. Is there some reason you didn't try some of the, the better ones? No, I didn't try the better ones uh, uh, for the, uh, it's just uh, because this, those two, uh, those three cases are uh, simple for me to, to try out. And also it depends on the number of uh, clusters you get for each position. And that I think matters a lot. And uh, uh, what we got here is only one try. We did not try other numbers. And the, the point here is to show applying the random forest approach to the components of a clustering model can still get additional improvements. So why is it that you applied the random forest to some of them but not to others? Yeah, the, the problem is this. If you look at the first component of the predict model, uh, it's uh, the word given the two periods words and the class. Uh, in, that, in which case you will have, because we always do uh, hard clustering, so a word can belong to only one class. Then for each class you have a different vocabulary. And you have a different amount of training data. Sometimes uh, there's only one word in one uh, class, so you basically don't get anything. It, the, the, the probability will simply be one for that word. 
and zero for others. So uh, I did not get into that because there are too many class classes. So your guess is that it won't actually help even if you apply it. Right. It may not help. I didn't try. Okay, great. Yeah, for the second model, you see, if you see uh, the second component, you get the same amount of Trinity as the uh, uh, trigram case. Okay, then I try this with the structure language model. Uh, in the structure language model, we try to assign a joint probability distribution to a parse and a word. Uh, the probability distribution is in this uh, product form where you have three components for predictor, tagger, and parser. And the difficulty here of, of applying the random forest approach is you have three components, then you, have, you need three random forest probabilities. And it's, uh, it's not easy to fit 100 decision trees for each model into the memory so that you can have an online computation. And that's why we took a, a different approach where we use a different decision tree triple for the three models. So each time, the three decision trees are different. Um, and we compute the probabilities and then get a word, probability, word by word probabilities. And finally, we take the average of that. Uh, we see this as uh, an approximation of what we want to do. Um, and still, um, uh, comparing to the connection baseline, in which uh, we got 138. It's already uh, uh, better than a baseline trigram. And we, we can improve that by more than 10% and reduce that to uh, uh, about 123. So to sum up the perplexing results, we have this table where we try different models. And uh, we see the engram and the structure length model are the cases probably uh, worth uh, trying out for the speech recognition experiments. Uh, simply because the relative improvements in the two cases are uh, more than 10% and uh, much better than the baseline. So um, for speech recognition, we tried uh, two different corpora. The first one is the uh, uh, Wall Street Journal. And we performed m scoring. And we used either 20 or 40 million words of training data. And we used uh, the uh, DARPA 93 Hub 1 test data for evaluating the performance. This is a fairly small test set. It has about 3,500 3, uh, 3, words. So the baseline word error rate uh, is about 13.7, which uses uh, cast back off for smoothing and uh, <coughs> all 40 million words uh, in the training data. And the Oracle error rate, uh, which is the uh, best possible you can get on this MBES list, is about 6%. So if we apply the random forest in the same way as before uh, for the trigram um, on the, uh, 20 million or 40 million words, we, we, we got significant improvements in uh, word array. And notice here, uh, the, uh, using 20 million words, we already got better result than using 40 million words uh, with the connectionized smoothing. And, uh, we uh, used this for the structure language model, but since uh, it's a fairly uh, large amount of data, um, it's probably that not that large, only 20 million words. We, we couldn't fit uh, the, the, all the uh, decision trees to all the three different models. Uh, instead, we used uh, the decision, random decision trees for only the predictor model. And still, we got um, about 1% gain in the uh, what error rate. And this is, uh, uh, again, a very small test set and a fair, fairly amount of data, but not a huge amount of data, right? And then uh, last year in the speech recognition evaluation, IBM used about more than 800 million words uh, in their language models. Uh, it's a conversational telephony speech uh, system for rich transcription in which IBM uh, scored uh, number one in the evaluation. Uh, there, there are different corpora. Uh, the Fisher data is about 22 million words. And there's web data collected by University of Washington, uh, 525 million words. I would say this is a fair amount of data. 
Um, and uh, the lattice language model used a foreground with the interpolated gneissonite smoothing and uh, pruned to have uh, only 3.2 million unique engrams. Uh, that's only for the uh, implementation of IBM. So the test set is here is, uh, is what they call a DEV04. It's the set they use to um, uh, test their systems. It has about 37,000 words in uh, test. So we, we used uh, 110 random decision trees uh, for embedded random forest foreground. And the reason to choose 110 is not uh, uh, significant because uh, this is a large amount of data. Sometimes the tree construction will crash. So I always run more, uh, try to construct more trees than uh, 100. So in this case, 110 really uh, was, were constructed. So I used all of them. And we sampled the data without replacement just for efficiency. And uh, um, <clears throat> in the baseline model, uh, I mentioned before it has uh, 3.2 uh, million unique engrams. The baseline result was 14.4. And if you uh, rescore that using a Fisher four-gram Knesset model, uh, you get about 0.3 percent again, which is 14.1 now here. And if you interpolate the Fisher model and the Web model uh, from 525 million words, you you get additional 0.4 percent. And if I uh, construct random forest on the 20 million words of Fisher data, I can uh, reduce the word area to 13.5, which is already better than the CNAS-9 model with more than uh, 500 million words. And if I, again, use the random forest model for also the web data, uh, in, for which I also sampled without replacement to uh, manageable size and uh, use a different sample for each different decision tree, I can get the uh, back the 0.4% gain from adding this data. And both improvements are statistically significant. Do you also have perplexity numbers? I don't have perplexity numbers. What was the relative improvement in perplexity? I don't know. Yeah. So I'm a bit confused. Uh, did you say that the IBM baseline was at 14.4? Yeah, that's when they use a uh, uh, 3.2 million engram lounge model. Uh, they always because, oh, you were saying that that's because they pruned their uh, language model. But right. they, used, they used Fisher data and they used the web data just as you did. No, uh, they actually used uh, all other data from switchboard, broadcast news, and so on, in which they reduced the word error to 13.4 uh, to use 800 million words instead so, of 500. So, so it, this is not on the state of the art baseline. Their, their state of the art result is 13.4. Yes. Uh, the absolute best result you can get for this test set is 13.4. And you could not run on that baseline? Um, it's an uh, interpolation of seven different language models, uh, from which we found the feature and web data are the most important components. That's why we chose to run this. And if, if I took the other models as is using a, a interpolated connection model smoothing and uh, still using the same interpolation weight and interpolate with my random forest model, <coughs> so I can still get 13.1. So basically, so if I think that if you take their state of state, state of the art lattices, which are at 13.4, 14.4, that's the lattices they give me. <clears throat> and then, if the maybe we can take this offline. Okay. Well, basically, the improvement from using this approach uh, can be applied to all the components, right? I tried two components, and this is already better than. Uh, the absolute baseline, they use uh, everything, like 800 million words. So is the point that if you wanted to do a fair comparison with that, you would have to build random forests on five more copper? Right. And the result here is still, uh, still the uh, forestry general. 
No, this is on the feature conversation. Feature conversation. Yes. Okay. So you took uh, the letters that IBM generated, right? Which they reporting RTO for, right? Okay. <clears throat> so uh, now we can see that actually uh, there are pra practical limitations in this approach. It's basically in the in the memory usage. And the decision tree construction uses much more memory than the interpolated Knesni. And uh, it's not easy, therefore, to realize the, the performance gain when the training data is really large, uh, much larger than 500 million words, let's say. So <clears throat> we always used uh, more than 100 trees, and the final model becomes too large to uh, fit into the memory. Therefore, we have to run uh, the rescoring re in parallel and that incurs extra computational cost. Yeah. How big are the trees? What's the average depth? Or um, it depends on the number of uh, engram, distinct engrams in your training data. So basically, it's uh, less than half of the uh, unique engrams in the Kinesina. For example, if a Kinesina has a million unique engrams, uh, uh, sorry, histories, then the decision tree will have less than half of that. On average, if you compute the average number of histories in a node, it will be like two to three. So therefore, we think uh, uh, some effective language model compression or pruning uh, is still an uh, open question for this approach. And in conclusion, I have uh, constructed a random forest uh, modeling approach for language models. And it's a more general representation for language models uh, uh, because it is a superset of decision tree language models and again a superset of uh, engram language models. And the um, randomization in, in this approach uh, actually uh, does a randomized history clustering and in which we uh, gain a very good generalization power is better than engram uh, uh, the in coverage and also is less biased uh, toward the training data. And uh, uh, we extended uh, Brahman's random forest idea to, uh, in, in this work to deal with the data sparseness problem. And uh, the random forest uh, actually uh, um, <clears throat> have the, the power of focusing on some uh, words in some decision trees and some other words in some others. So that's why the uh, collaborative contribution of the trees uh, achieve uh, uh, significant improvements. And then we showed improvements uh, in perplexity and uh, both uh, uh, perplexity and word error rate uh, over the interpolated Knesset for different models, including engrams, uh, class based, uh, and the structure language model. And we, uh, we achieved significant improvements in the best performing large vocabulary conversational telephone and speech system um, for 2004. And thank you. So we have to just show the official results as a function of N in the same program. I don't have that. I don't have that. Either IBM or BPA in, the, in their RT uh, workshop, they actually show that using higher order engram is doing better than the lower order. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, yeah. They used the four gram. Uh, IBM, I don't think IBM did that. Maybe BBN did. Yeah, it's, it could be slightly better if you use five gram because of the larger amount of data available. Uh, but I don't know how much better it so would be. I expect probably the same thing will happen in your case, whereas your perplexity result don't really show much. For the one million words, yeah, yeah. Yes, that has yeah. to do with the amount of data. Right. Yes? Is there something, or can you point out what's special about decision trees uh, that made you want to choose those to do the history clustering? Could you imagine using another classifier that doesn't have the drawbacks of decision trees to do history clustering? Or is there something about decision trees that <coughs> makes them stand apart? The, the reason we, we, we use the decision tree uh, is uh, the automatic uh, automatic uh, question construction and question selection in uh, the tree construction. And that's the only reason we use the decision tree. 
if uh, if uh, there are other classifiers uh, which can uh, do the same thing and with uh, uh, which doesn't have the uh, drawback of these entries, I think it, it would be interesting to try that out. Yes. Uh, yeah, I've been asking fewer questions in the Ah. Uh, so a long time ago at IBM, uh, I think I think the group included included Fred. They they used decision trees for language modeling with with clusters. Uh, you know you know the work I'm talking about. Right. Can you, can you compare your work to the, to their work? Well, they they used uh, 20 words in the history. Okay. And what they found was uh, the decision tree itself is not better than uh, they used in, uh, deleted interpolation at that time for smoothing in a, in a trigram. And the decision tree with 20 words in the history uh, was not better than the trigram. And it's only when they interpolated with the trigram, they got some, uh, I think it's about 7% uh, improvements. Um, I would say if they use interpolated connection line for that case, I don't know if they can get the same amount of improvements. In my approach, another thing is I tried to interpolate uh, the uh, connection line model with uh, the random forest model I present here, and there's no uh, further improvements by doing that. So it's basically the random forest at one end and the uh, uh, connection line at the other end is the straight line. Yeah. So uh, I have two questions. So uh, first question is, um, in the switchboard experiments, you all of a sudden uh, needed to do sampling of the training data. And uh, it's unclear. You did not experiment with sampling interacting with your decision tree random forest building procedure on Upen Tree Bank or On Upen Tree Bank, I actually did. Oh, you did that? Yes. I did not show here. I actually did. So I would think that somehow the sampling, the way you sample may matter, like depending on which angle you're doing. That's true. Yeah. Um, uh, in fact, um, if I just sample the data, uh, uh, if I don't perform other randomization in the decision tree constructor, I can still get a random forest model. Okay? That one was not as good as if I do randomization in both cases. And then the final result was uh, it's almost the same as if I don't sample the data. So your point is that sampling the training data is yet another dimension along which you randomize the decision tree process. Right, right. And that dimension is not uh, going to change the result much. Okay. And uh, the second question I have is, I, I don't understand very well what the model size is, like storage-wise. How many parameters do I need to store relative to an n-gram? And the reason I'm asking this is because uh, that's important. And yeah. uh, I always have the option of growing the n-gram bigger. Yes. I can, I can throw more training data just as these IBM guys are doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can uh, grow it deeper, like use higher order in the n-gram. And uh, those are, you know, sort of legitimate ways of uh, the engram camp to compete with your approach, I mm -hmm. would think, right? So do you have any comments on that? So far, I did not look into the pruning approach for my uh, Grand Forest model. So I'm using a very straightforward storage I mean, way of storing the the uh, decision trees and the counts. So it's basically one decision tree is almost the same as one connection I was model in, in the storage. So it's basically 100 times. So um, if you grow the um, the uh, size of the model uh, 100 times, I think from what uh, IBM did. You gain from 14.1 uh, to 13.4 by growing a model from 20 million words to about 800 million words, so 40 times. Um, well, that's the size of the training. It doesn't mean that the model grows 40 times. Well, that's true. So, right, right. Yeah, you're right. 
So that's the only thing I can say is, um, I don't... I get a significant improvement. Right. Uh, Chupian, I don't agree with you because IBM used more data and squeezed the last drop they could for the evaluation and reported, what, 13.4. He's used a subset of that data and has ended up with a better number. So to argue that you could use more data and grow the model, well, apparently not, because they tried that. So another thing I would like to say is I can uh, use my model uh, to uh, the in-domain data. For example, in this case, fit the feature data and interpolate with whatever the model they want to build uh, using more data, in which I probably cannot handle. And then I can still get a significant improvement on top of that. To me, it seems like the strength of what you're doing is being able to squeeze the last drop from some limited amount of data that you know that is very relevant to your task. Mm -hmm. And that's where you gain right. over some other approach. They, cannot, they can throw more data at it, but the data is not that relevant. It doesn't help them all that much. If you would just focus on the training data for switchboard, Fisher, or whatever it is, you can squeeze the last drop out of it, and that's helping you. Mm -hmm. Right. Or is that, you know, throwing more than So I think it's an interesting thing. Yeah. yeah. So rel relating to the classes that besides the split in this tree, you are talking about what identity has to be criteria. I, think um, I don't think it's the best thing it's to do. It's a terrible thing. It's, 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 a, it's a very mechanical thing to do. Is anything better uh, than just a little uh, But the thing is, uh, we, we also try the in the structure language model in which it will be slightly different, right? You, not, you, you don't just ask about the word identity, you also ask about the, the syntax label yeah, and, and so on. And we also try to, to ask about uh, the word cluster identity in a word clustering approach. And that gave uh, almost I mean, exa exactly the same uh, performance as the word identity itself. So before uh, we, we can figure out what's good to ask about, uh, I think this approach is uh, straightforward. But that, that is no research done on how to optimally construct the questions. Not yet. Oh, yeah. That's a uh, pretty much open area. Yes. So in the back of you always back off to a lower order either an engram, SNI, or a lower order forest. But within the tree, do you think about just backing off up the tree so you're not only using the leaf but internal nodes? Initially, I tried that. And uh, I didn't find that better than the Knesset approach. But no, you could back off using like a Knesset style back off of the tree. I, I know, but the problem there is there, there are too many levels in the tree. And uh, also, the criterion we use to evaluate the questions is training data likelihood. Right. It's very often that along the path, you see similar behavior, right? If you back off uh, maybe very uh, to the very beginning of the tree, you may catch some engram there. And uh, then, because of the backup weight, it, the probability becomes much smaller, and uh, you don't really gain. Okay. Thanks. Yes, I would actually want to ask you about the clustering identity because it seems like you can probably get a little bit more by doing the equivalence <coughs> clustering of the histories and the and the predicted word together. But it seems like you can. Is that what you're saying? Well, it's so like for example, neural network model basically seems to do everything, right? You just throw everything at it and it builds a cluster. Whereas you are basically building a cluster using the history part only. Mm -hmm. And then you are using some other method to do clustering. So it's kind of interesting that you did not get any further improvement by trying to unify the two together. I don't think that's the best way to unify the two because oh, no, that's those, not two, I those you. two should be uh, interacting with each other. Exactly. And uh, I haven't figured out how this interaction should be done. OK, but I thought in answer to Lee, you, you said that you actually had clustering questions also. Oh, that's part. only for the clustering of the history words. Oh, OK, OK, OK. Yeah. Oh, so you, did not, you have not yet tried to combine the two? No. OK. The other question I have is, uh, do you see the similar kind of trend where you're, with the number of trees, it saturates pretty quickly, even on a larger corpus? For the uh, IBM system, since I did not test the perplexity, so I don't have that. Okay. But for the Wall Street Journal, uh, the 
40 million words, I did find, I did find um, the word error rate trend in, in, in number of decision trees. And it's very interesting that the best you can do is not by having 100 trees, it's by having about 10 or 20. Because sometimes you're lucky, right? you, you get 100, you get 10 good trees and, and some later part you get 10 bad trees and that uh, kind of compensate each other. And, and basically the, the, the power is uh, the convergence. The more you have, the better you, you, you get. Did, did you end up using 10 or 20 trees or 100 in the results you presented? 100 in the results I presented. This kind of, uh, I mean, you know, the space of trees is huge. And the fact that you can get saturated quickly, maybe it has something to do with the, the fact that you're actually skewing your selection criteria heavily towards a certain good direction. Yeah, even, even for good trees, the space is still enormous because we do this randomization at each node. And, and uh, why is it then that you know, with 10 trees, you can saturate. It seems kind of... Well, with 10 trees, it's not saturated yet. Even with 100, you cannot simply say it's saturated, right? Uh -huh. It's just uh, the, the, yeah, the... but there's a noticeable kind of... <laughs> oh, yeah, like there is ten. noticeable. That if I had means to pick a number to stop, I would pick 10. That means you can probably squeeze out a, a very small amount from adding more trees, but the significant, uh, significant count, uh, amount is from the beginning. So, I mean, either that or it's because, you know, your, your distribution is not, I mean, you're, you're skewing your selection criteria so heavily that, that, that by increasing the number, you're not getting enough diversity. Is that possible? That's, that's possible, but that's not very likely because uh, uh, at each node, the, the problem with this approach also we, is with each node, I don't know how many possibilities there are because uh, I don't know how many local optima there are. So I can only try a initial, a random initialization and let it go. Right? So it, it, in, in your question, you think maybe in some cases we have very similar trees. Well, the but, trees are not dissimilar, but basically because they have grown using some kind of similar criteria, they may not be exploring the space full. That's the, possible, yes. The trees yes. might look different, but share the same bias. Yeah. That's possible, yes. Uh, one last question, uh, and uh, that's basically, uh, uh, yeah, actually, I'll, 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 I'll ask you later. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you.